Now for our first speaker in the morning, someone who doesn't have a sore throat. Uh, P.G. Myers, uh, most of you uh, are most familiar uh, with, uh, with P.G. Meyer. Uh, if you ever if you think about P.G. Meyer, if you ever think about him at all, you connect it with his blog uh, that, that he writes, but he's got a day job too, and I want uh, all of our speakers are respected scientists, and I want to emphasize the things that they do. He's, he's a biology professor, uh, evolutionary biology, I always thought that was a repetitive redundancy, say evolutionary bio biology. Uh, and he works, uh, he specializes in uh, zebrafish. Uh, it's an interesting field of uh, evolutionary development biology. And you might be interested in picking up a copy of his uh, treatise on the analysis of spontaneous motor activity in embryonic uh, zebrafish. I, I commend that to you. I, he may even autograph that for you. I'm sorry we don't have a copy of it in the bookstore. But he is a regular attendee of these. He is always very entertaining and very enlightening. And he is one of those people, one of those scientists that, that Liz Cornwell was talking about last night who can convey the complexity of science to the general public, a popularizer that is sorely needed to uh, convince the general public who are deficient in their science knowledge about the, the facts and about the, the, the methodology that science goes through and why it is far more true than the myth of the Stone Age people. And with that, I give you P.C. Myers. We built it 
We use science and technology to assemble this elaborate construction. And why? I mean, it's not like they're mining for oil up there, right? This is a testimony to a spirit of discovery. This is curiosity. That's what atheism is about. There's, there's no God belief behind this at all. This is human beings using their brains to do awesome, amazing things. So that's, that's part of the soul of atheism, is that reaching out and learning new things. And just going to Mars, you know, that I, I could sit around all day and just look at pictures of Mars. That's, that's one of the most amazing things that's happened in my lifetime. But of course, that was all physics and engineering. Okay, I'm a biologist. So I gotta got show you some biology. And you're gonna have to indulge me a little bit on this one because I'm gonna show you a video, all right? And I wonder, can we have the lights down a little bit? Is that possible to turn those down? Let's try it first. We'll try it first, but if it, okay, if you can't see it, then bring it up. So I just wanna show you this, this video. Uh, this, we don't have a sound connection here, so we'll see if I can make this work. Um, this is an awesome video too.
You're lucky. I'm only making you sit for three minutes of that. We, I could just shut up and we can show seven o'clock videos and clips all that long. But I, I understand some people don't get into it as much as I do. But I, I will say a few things about this that I think is really amazing. That um, you know, Mars Curiosity is a wonderful thing. I'm going to take away from it, but it's not going to find anything as awesome as that on Mars. It's all down there in the ocean. It's all around us. That this is the planet of biology, and there are these epically amazing, wonderful things going on all around us that we have to appreciate. So yeah, if this were church, I'd be saying, okay, there's our moment of awe and reverence, right? This is this is what makes us feel, at least some of us, the coolness of the world around us. That what we appreciate is the strangeness, the complexity, the richness of the world we live in. And as atheists, there's something else to this. That we are happy to say, this is all there is. Because it is so powerful and cool. That we don't need the supernatural, we don't need imaginary gods to make that beautiful. I want, to, I want to quote Mick Stenger here because he said something something really marvelous the other day uh, in his talk that the ancient picture of a purely material universe composed of elementary particles and nothing else continues to be our best description of reality. This is true. That what is is what is. And this is how I came to atheism. Uh, there, was, there was no revelation, there was no inspiration. Uh, the words, there is no God, did not suddenly appear magically in my brain. Uh, what it was was an appreciation of science that led me here. It was things like the space program. It was dinosaurs. It was watching Mr. Wizard on television. Um, I learned as an extent to put it so clearly that there are natural explanations for our universe and that they work. That there was no need to invoke supernatural forces. In fact, bringing in an invisible prestidigitator cheapens the stories. Telling me that a space ghost did it with magic is simply a cop-out. And I rejected that. Now, I began living my life as a godless atheist in my teens. And accepting this idea that there's nothing in life but this universe and the physical matter and the forces that make up make it up. They have only one life to live, and that it's all pretty damn wonderful. That's the way we work. And it's not reducing the universe to say that there are no supernatural forces. It is making it greater. It's making it something accessible. It's making it something that's part of us. Now, like I said, I came to this my teens. Many of you came to it at early ages too. I've talked to a lot of people though, and what brought them to atheism was this. And I bet you there's some of you out there right now. I saw a handbook, yes. That uh, I think any atheist organization has to admit that the greatest revitalizing thunderbolt of the last decade was this book, The God Delusion. I have met so many people who have told me that this was the explanation that opened their eyes. Uh, the best part of Gardner's book, I thought, was the attitude. Scientists have a way of looking at the world. They have a toolkit that is powerful, that enriches our lives and saves lives. And it opens up a universe of wonder to us all. And maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't shy away from turning those powerful tools on our sacred cows. And when we do, when we have some of humanity's most hallowed, most sacred, most revered notions turn out to be delusions and distractions that turn us away from what matters. I think that's the fundamental message here, that as human beings, we have a way of looking at the world. We have a way that uses science. And when we use science, it answers problems. It resolves questions for us. We should do more of that, I think. <laughs> so, you know, I propose this, that you know, atheism is the radical notion that we should live our lives by the principles of reason and evidence. 
that is, by science. Now, can we actually do this? Of course we can. Many of us already do. There is this misconception out there in popular culture that living our lives rationally means a denial of wonder and joy. And it certainly does not. Wonder and joy are the primary characteristics of a scientist's dedication to his or her discipline. I don't know a single science, scientist who doesn't live their life by joy and wonder. It's not us sitting around with our science flight rules and calculators measuring everything. We do this because we love Mars, because we love cephalopods, we love zebrafish, we love chemistry, we love physics. It's all beautiful stuff. <laughs> now, it does suggest, though, that if you're going to find some purpose in your life, if you're going to set yourself greater goals, maybe you should put some thought into it. Maybe when you set out on a task in your life, you should ask yourself a question. Is there a good reason to do this? Is there evidence for this? Do I have a path to achieve this goal? This stuff, living your life by science, by reason and evidence. You know, every time I see someone in a dog collar, I, I see this great tragedy. One life that could have been dedicated to service to humanity. And many priests do find worth in service. That's what they're about. That has been sub subordinated to the goal of propping up myths and lies. So, you know, one of the things I decided to do when I before I came up with it, I said, look at what goals do atheist organizations set for themselves? Yeah, let's scrutinize ourselves. It's easy to criticize the religious, but can we look at ourselves and ask, what do our organizations do? What does Atheist Alliance of America do? What do they think is important? And so I looked up secular causes. What are the secular causes that we're, we're out? And I'm going to give you some quotes from some of the mission statements that these organizations have. So here's an old AAA, okay. Their vision is to transform society in one that supports and respects worldview based on the values of reason, empiricism, and naturalism, and respects and protects the separation of religion and government. I like it, that's good, that's clear, that's simple. Uh, here's American Atheists, dedicated working for the civil rights of atheism, promoting separation of state and church, and providing information about atheism. This is also very good, it's very well focused. Uh, here's the American Humanist Association. Humanists are always more long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's a bad thing. That's, that's fine. Uh, so they strive to bring out a progressive society where being good without God is an accepted way to live life. So they're focusing a little more on morality. We accomplish this sort of defense of civil liberties and secular governance by outreach to the growing number of people without religious belief or preference, and so continued refinement and advancement of the human worldview. Now, this stuff is just, I'm just giving you a little from these you know, if you go to their websites, you'll find much more substantial stuff a lot that you want to But what I hear you see here is something really interesting. And that is that atheist organizations' primary goals, and I'm just saying these are good goals, are to defend the rights of atheists to exist. <coughs> that's essential and necessary. It's kind of sad that that's essential and necessary. <laughs> but that's what we put a lot of our effort into is just getting these, these organizations, politi politics, and so forth, to recognize our existence and our right to exist. I mean, Herb, Herb Silverman talked about this last night. But he, he spent years working on this, trying to get this minimal acceptance of his existence as a political and, and civil member of society who wants to participate in government. So we have to fight for this. And as we saw at the Republican National Convention last week, uh, there's this strong strain of Bible walloping anti atheism at work in this country. Here's Marco Rubio. Anybody watch that speech? How many of you cried? <laughs> yeah, I cried, cringed, just were horrified at God, 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 all night long. Um, this is what he says. You know, he's saying, he's coming right there, that faith is our greatest virtue, our greatest American value. Faith is a lie. Faith is a vice. Faith is something we have to fight. 
And one of the things that these organizations have to do is be forthright in standing up and saying, no, we don't live the unexamined life. We don't accept things simply because you say so, or because your holy book says so, or because the voices in your head tell you so. Now what we have to do is live lives by reason and evidence. Now, I agree with the sentiment of the atheist organizations that we have to fight for that recognition of our existence. That's an important goal. It's kind of a core principle, right? If we don't have a right to exist, it doesn't matter what else we've got going for us. Uh, it's going to be squelched. So keep fighting for that. But we also need something more. You know, I just told you that atheism is about living our lives by the principles of science, by reason and evidence. And while the right to live is a fundamental principle, there has to be more. Why do we, why do we assert ourselves as atheists? I mean, it'd be so much easier to say, okay, I, I give up, I'll go to church. I'll just go along. I won't believe, but I'll pretend. And then I can go on about my life and achieve my life's goals by sucking up to the assholes of the world. That's one approach you can take. But the other way is to just come right out and assert yourself and say, okay, I have secular values. I have beliefs that I think are really important. That I think there are other causes that are important, not just our right to exist, that what we have to do is fight for something beyond that. And we've had many examples of that over this past weekend. Uh, you know, I would say that you know, Liz Corwell and Guillermo both talked about this. What about science education? Is that a reasonable second cause? Should we be fighting for that? This is a map, by the way, of, uh, of state science standards. And what you see there is the states where human evolution is treated to various degrees. The red states are the places where human evolution is not specified at all in the state science standards. Now, that's sad, isn't it? Here's this fundamental question of where we come from, who we are. And the schools are afraid to address it. We hate the I think that's part of the things we should be fighting for is why are we fighting about what we're going to fight for. And one of them is a recognition of reality. Oh, I always, it happens to be a state that doesn't have a state science standard in this field. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the black hole of Iowa is saying they're getting more friendly. Yeah, so they, they couldn't judge what it said. But it States all have science standards to specify what you can talk in various grades, uh, except Iowa just completely neglects this one whole area of biology, which is kind of weird. But uh, yeah, you can see these varying degrees of support for human evolution out there. So, should science education be one of the causes of the atheist movement? And I think we'd all say, yeah. Right? Yeah. I think it's an important one. Because you know, if we're going to live our lives by reality, we better have a good idea what reality is. So what we've got is we've got advocates for science who are prominent in the atheist movement. Richard Dawkins, Liz Cornwell, any of the scientists that you guys drag up here to stand at a podium and, and lecture at you. So that's a big thing. Uh, here's another one. Though. What about this one? Should we be making environmentalism a, a, an atheist cause? It's part of science, right? It's our only planet that we live on. Yes, Mars Curiosity is a robot. It's on Mars. We are not on Mars. Uh, we better go and protect what we've got. And right now, we've got all kinds of emerging crises in the planet. We've got global climate change going on. We've got the acidification of the oceans. We've got de declining species diversities. We are fishing the oceans into barrenness. All of this stuff is going on right now. And there are people actively denying it. There are people who are using religion as an excuse to deny it. You heard of this fellow Shimkus, who's on a uh, House Committee on Energy and the Environment, who said that we don't have to worry about global warming because in the Bible, God promised he would never flood the earth again. What kind of excuse is that? That's, yes, OK, that's a stupid excuse. <laughs> so that's, that's one of our issues. We should be addressing environmentalism. We should have this as one of our main causes. Because, yeah, if, if we don't pay attention to it, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to predict the demise of the human race, though that is a possibility. But I will 
say that they will change the world so much that maybe our views aren't viable anymore. So we should be working for this. Okay, let's stretch it a little more. I think most of us can accept this. What about this one? Civil rights for minorities, is that an atheist cause? Yes. Yeah. Science. Science too. You know, that's that's what I'm looking for in our atheist organizations is this recognition that if we are going to answer these thorny problems, that the way to do that is with science. Right? That we can apply that toolkit to every single goddamn problem out there. Science, education, environmentalism, yeah, it's a problem of discrimination, inequity, all kinds of issues of education in this country towards minorities. And there is a right answer. Atheism is the path. No, not atheism itself, not the denial of the existence of God, but the recognition that we have to live our, world, our lives by rational principles. We apply those to these problems and we say, yeah, it's not fair. We should fix that. What about this one? Yes. Man, you're using crap. <laughs> this is good. Yeah, that we, sh we should be openly supporting gay marriage. Why? Because, again, we're applying that objective scientific view to things. And, you know, realistically, there is no good reason to deny one group of people civil rights. That gay people are not bad people. There's probably some gay people right here in this audience. Gay people are ethics. Gay people are also religious. You're all here. That you have an equal right to participate in this society. What right do we, heterosexuals, as a majority, have to deny that right to others? So I think that's another case where we can come to a rational conclusion. Now let's challenge you a little, a little bit more about this one. I heard a lot of women's voices up here. Should feminism be an atheist cause? You might say, oh well, look at the definition. The definition doesn't say anything about women. It just says no God. You know, that's all there is to atheism. But I think it's the case that this is another issue where we can look at it objectively and we can, we can agree with the statement that women are people. <laughs> I'm a biologist. I take my word for it. <laughs> I've looked. I've examined the details. <laughs> but you know, right now in this community, there are some people who say maybe this is pushing it too far. You know, this, this radical notion of women are people, that they should have equal value and importance in the atheist movement is generating a tremendous <laughs> backlash on the web right now. It is remarkable to me that the trivial idea that maybe women should expect to be intellectual contributors on the equal with us guys, rather than eye candy to be gnawed on the bar, has produced so much division and anger in the online atheist community over the past year or so. It has provoked some people to argue that the only meaning of atheism is, is that dictionary definition. They have taken this really radical proposition that no, we cannot have any additional overloading of the atheist cause, that we draw the line here, atheism now is just about denying the existence of gods. And I say if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to throw out Richard Dawkins. Because Richard Dawkins is one of those people who has greatly promoted the deeper meaning of atheism, that science and atheism are intertwined, that an atheism without science is kind of barren and boring and will not take off as it has in the last decade. You know, what, they, what, what people really want to do is they want to take this gigantic step back and revoke the whole idea that there's a greater depth to our philosophy because if there is a greater depth to our philosophy, it implies that the interactions between sexes are to become more complicated as if they weren't already. And unfortunately, I'm seeing on this, on the web, we're seeing a huge, huge response to this. It's painful to see. I want to show you an example of what I think is an excellent sarcastic response to this. Um, 
this is an attitude that many people take. Now, a while back, I know him, he's, he's an Australian uh, atheist and skeptic, and he's, he's on the side of feminism. So he's making a joke here about these people who are saying, you know, for this rubbish about feminism, equality, social justice, we want to be told we're awesome for not believing in dogs. <laughs> That's enough. That in some ways, uh, there's a perception that atheism is becoming a sort of self congratulatory back padding group of people who sit there and tell themselves that they're superior to everyone else on the planet because we have achieved this one success, which is we've rejected gods. Now, I might disagree with this sentiment a little bit because apparently it really is rather difficult to escape the indoctrination of our childhood. There aren't that many people who are atheists. It's, it turns out to be really hard. So let me at least tell you all this. You actually are awesome for not believing in gods. <laughs> what I'm telling you today is we have to do more. There's more to this. That if there are no gods, we have to recognize the implications and consequences of that belief and follow through. You can't simply rest on your laurels and say, oh, well, I accomplished something that P.C. Myers did when he was 12 years old. <laughs> Therefore, I'm magnificent. <laughs> you know, I can't do that either, so, you know, don't do that. And then the other, thing, the other side of this that's coming out is, is I want to show you a rather cynical view, a dark view of atheism that, that is meant in all sincerity and is actually a reasonable response to the issue that's going on right now. And I want you to think about this. This is not an enemy of atheism. This is Hanger Edis, who says, he makes this prediction about atheism. He doesn't fully accept, Brenda Christina has been a strong advocate for this, that, that atheism demands social justice. It's a case I also make, that atheism demands social justice. And he rejects that. He says, no, because you know, if you look at atheism, and I mentioned there are people like this here in this room, uh, there's a strong libertarian aspect of American atheism. There's the Ayn Rand influence on atheism. Uh, there are Republicans who are atheists. Karl Rove is an atheist. Why don't you invite him to speak? <laughs> so there's, there's this strong strain of a different form of atheism that actually takes very different perspectives on the issues that I heard a lot of people saying yes to just a moment ago. And he just makes this prediction. In other words, the most likely course for atheism in the US is it will remain a marginal preoccupation among well curmudgeonly white males. And I think he's talking about me. <laughs> it's just to the extent that there's a we at all, the sense of we atheists, we are a remarkably useless bunch in political terms. And I put up this bleak, cynical perspective because there is some truth to this. Yes, I look around this audience. We are a very pale group, right? <laughs> we are, I know this, this has been a great conference. I notice it's not all men. That's, we're getting better at the community. <laughs> but there are all these other people who are saying, you know, science is really cool, but I'm trying to feed my kids and I can't get a job. That, I'm discriminated against. I have other priorities, and you atheists aren't addressing them. That what you atheists are doing is talking about the stuff that the curmudgeonly white males think are really important. And we have to open up and reach out to these other groups. Now, this is, like I said, this is a very bleak perspective on our future. Uh, this would be a very sad movement if it turned into all white guys sitting out here telling us we're awesome. God, that, that would be so sad. That would be so uninteresting. Uh, but there, are, there is hope. And I want to mention one thing very briefly. Uh, that's the atheism plus movement. I don't know I'm, I'm not exactly jumping on the bandwagon. I'm watching it go by with a big smile on my face and thinking, hey, maybe I should hit your ride. This is looking pretty good. Because what this represents is, a, is another face of atheism that has, been felt, has felt unrepresented by us. That we have to do a better job of reaching them. Atheism plus is simply atheism plus social justice. 
saying that these other values are just as important as science, for instance, and science education, and environmentalism, that we ought to pay attention to the concerns of minorities and women. They're saying, this has got to be a part of our movement. And it is just, it's been amazing. It's, what, two weeks old? And people are flocking to it. There are, I, I've read so many comments from people on Atheism Plus where they're saying, finally, something that gives me hope in the Atheist movement. So what are you going to do? I mean, are we all just going to say, oh, well, we're just we're Atheist Plus now, or we're second humans now, or whatever? Uh, I don't think so. I think what we have to do is adapt or die. That what this is is a message to us, to atheist organizations everywhere, that we have to step up our game a little bit and broaden our reach. And maybe we'll all be atheist plusers eventually. That's fine. We'll, maybe we'll find a better name to play. Uh, what I would like to see happen is that atheism becomes synonymous with a concern for real issues of real human beings, not just science, science is still important, but also social values. So I want to conclude by giving you a, a challenge to atheist organizations, okay? There's some things that we could do right now. You know, I, I looked over the websites of the various atheist organizations, I looked at their position statements, I looked at their organization, and I said, okay, what do we really need to do now? And I think what we need to do as organizations is build more advocacy for greater causes. That science is an important one, but we also need to fight for environmentalism and social justice. That should be front and center on all of our position statements. That we should form groups that say, we are the environmental advocacy group, or we are the social advocacy group of AAA. That has to be up front. Because seriously, you know, I, I tried to look at our websites from a very objective point of view and ask, what does this site say to me? If I were a black woman coming to the site, I would say, I would say oh, this is the organization for curmudgeonly old white men. But I'm not interested in this. What would I say if I were a gay person? I'd, I'd look at that and say, oh, okay, that site says, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an atheist, I can go for that, but I got bigger issues to worry about right now. We gotta make that more prominent. I think one way to do this is simply to form special interest groups for these causes with top level prominence in our organizations. Then we need to say, okay, here's a feminist subgroup. And it's not just something you bury deep in the web page. It's not something that's lost. It's not something hard to find. It should be right up front. And it should be part of the face of this organization. This organization should be able to say, well, there's a women's cause is coming up. Bring up the feminist caucus. Have them speak out. Bring up the gay and lesbian caucus. They're the ones that should talk about this. Not yet again another old white curmudgeonly guy, right? We need to have them in positions of leadership. And you know, some, some groups do this. I mean, you know, I know AAA, American Atheist, all this, they have people who care about this stuff. It's there, but it's, it's often kind of buried. I would say that if you look at the uh, American Humanist Association webpage, they do a better job of, of organizing this. Uh, they actually have these different subgroups prominently displayed right there on the front page. You can go there and you can say, oh, well, I'm interested in the Feminist Caucus. Go there and here's all the information. Or the LGBT Humanist Council. Or any of these other organizations. You know, charities you care about charity helping people who are less well off than you are. That ought to be right there, front and center of every atheist organization. We have to do a better job of explaining why an atheist world is a better world than a religious world.
And finally, the big thing you have to do is we really have to prove Tyrone that this is wrong. Please do that. And I think the only way to do that is for us curmudgeonly white men to occasionally step down from the podium and let other people lead. So that's our goal. That's what we need to do. We need to have a broader atheism that still encompasses the same things all of us white guys do value, like science, but also embraces all the other goals that everyone wants to embrace because we plan to take over the world within my lifetime, I hope. Thank you.
Now, if you say, I'm going to make atheism, feminism, the entirety of our causes, atheism, you will chase them away, right? Uh, so that's that's about to get straight. Where we can say that you know, things like equal rights for women and minorities and others are front and center, part of our platform, part of our policy as atheists. That's one thing. But then we also need voices that lead that maybe one solution, as I suggest, is special interest groups. But maybe there are other ways to do this. And I would love to hear from you know, experts in, in running organizations and how to do that. You said that atheism is the radical notion that we should live our lives by principles of reason and theory, and that we can absolutely do this. But at the same time, we find from behavioral economics that to be human is, in some sense, to be fundamentally irrational and to make decisions that are not based on reason and not based on the evidence in front of us. And that this seems to be, in some sense, how we succeed as a social animal. What do you have to say to that? Yes, I I you know I'm this it's, it's not just economics, but psychology tells us this as well. You know, there's a lot of cognitive sciences that points out that human beings are fundamentally irrational in a lot of ways. Uh, but what we do as a coherent coherent society is we try to keep this in check. We try to displace them into appropriate activities, okay? So yeah, go go listen to a comedy club Saturday night, right? Go dancing. You know, have silly conversations with your friends. These are all irrational things. Um, what we don't want to do is say, well, because we are guided by science, we're going to say, we're, we're going to say we're like Spock and say, all oh, that stuff, that's, that's irrelevant, we're not going to do that. That's not the case. That you can, as a rational human being, take into account our fundamental irrationality. That what you can do is say, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to set this goal for rational reasons, but I'm going to have fun getting there, which is kind of irrational. But so what? It's how we motivate ourselves. And so I, I think we just have to recognize that tendency in ourselves and, and actually use it to help us get along. With your permission, I'd like to address the point about having subgroups that fracture your organization. Please do. Um, there are some very large and very successful uh, technical groups, like the IEEE and the ACM, Association for Computing Machinery, that have special interest groups. The people who are um, passionate about something uh, have separate meetings, and they come back and they make presentations or they do research that's available to all. It works tremendously well. They are very rich, uh, wonderful resources, and these groups are buttresses that make the whole thing better and stronger. Thank you. 